Welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is February 19th, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women. A job advertisement to recruit 30 female train drivers in Saudi Arabia has attracted 28,000 applicants. Women in Saudi Arabia are eager to work, and the kingdom opens up more opportunities to women these days. The 30 women selected as train drivers will operate bullet trains between the cities of Mecca and Medina after a year of paid training. Job opportunities for Saudi women have been limited to roles such as teachers and medical workers, as they had to observe strict gender segregation rules. Women weren't even allowed to drive in the kingdom until 2018. Female participation in the workplace has nearly doubled in the last five years to 33% amid a drive by the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to open up the kingdom and diversify the economy. And women are now taking up jobs once restricted to men. But the proportion of women working in the kingdom was still about half that of men in the third quarter of last year. And female unemployment was well more than three times higher than for men. What does this mean for women? Well, Saudi Arabia is one of the most restrictive places to live if you're a woman. And even there, they are making some progress and patriarchy is loosening its grip. I dream of the day when we read about Saudi Arabia and we learn that the freedom of choice is up to the woman and not the man who represents her. Don't give up hope. If we've come this far, there is more road to travel ahead. In other news, who is being ignored? When $66.9 billion is awarded to nonprofits to help fund their missions, yet only 0.5% of the nearly $67 billion goes to support ideas by Black women, something is very wrong with that. Do Black women not have good ideas? Are Black women incapable of helping to reshape society with nonprofits? Are Black women's contributions only valuable if it's shown on a TV screen? That pitiful percentage says one thing, Black women can entertain us, but their efforts at society's reformation, it doesn't matter. Why is that? Why are Black women overlooked when it comes to standing behind their efforts, our efforts? Why do I stand alone, yet a woman who makes socks for rocks get fully funded within minutes? Today we have Dr. Froswell Booker Drew, co-founder of Heritage Giving Circle, the first African-American woman's giving circle in Texas. On the show, she's here today. Dr. Frazo also works for the State Fair of Texas to level the playing field for black and brown organizations, ensuring that 70% of the organization's huge state fair funds are led by people of color. Dr. Frazo, welcome. Speak to us, tell us and everyone, why is it so important that black women-led organizations receive funding. So Erica, thank you so much for having me here and giving me this wonderful opportunity to share. You know, when Black women-led nonprofits don't get the funding that they need, it makes it difficult for them to do the work that they're doing in community. It makes it difficult to pay their staff. It is hard to be able to do the programming that they're providing. And it's unfair that they are doing all of this work and yet they're not getting the support that they need to continue. Smart Black women leaders are taking the time to create solutions for our society's problems, Dr. Frazo. They're creating nonprofits, yet looking at the statistics of those who receive support, it seems that no one cares. As an expert in fundraising for Black women-led nonprofits, what can a Black woman do when we have a dream to help shape society yet? We can't keep it going by ourselves. You know, it's important to realize that 0.6% of all funding in this country goes to organizations led by Black women. And when you think about how many billions of dollars are used to impact our communities, that's dismal. 
So one of the things that we have done in our local area is started a Black Women's Giving Circle called Heritage Giving Fund. And heritage is our way as Black women of pooling our dollars together to be able to make a difference. Since 2017, we've been able to take our own money and raise over $100,000 to give out to organizations led by Black women in our um, community of Dallas, Texas. And so what I would encourage people to do is think about not only how do you make the foundations in the philanthropic community accountable and asking them about who's on their board of directors and are those people of color and asking them about senior leadership of those foundations who have lived experience that can speak into the process. But in addition to that, take your money and begin to start using it in a way that can create the impact that we need in our communities. Wow. So, so you're saying while we can't control who supports our goals, we can control how we manage our success once we do achieve it. If it's important that our ideas are funded, our ideas are funded, we must make it a priority to create a strategic plan to give back once we do reach the level of financial success that we know we can achieve. Then this problem of Black women being underfunded won't be a problem in the future. We may not be a part of their percentage, but when we make sowing seeds into Black women a part of our financial responsibility as leaders, their percentage won't matter anymore. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Fraser, for enlightening us today. Take a deep breath, Tierica. That was powerful. In other news, according to NYPD data, Hate crimes motivated by anti-Asian sentiment jumped by 1,900% since the pandemic began. This past weekend, Christina Yuna Lee, a senior creative producer at the digital music platform Splice, was killed in her own apartment by 25-year-old Asama Nash, who followed Lee into her building after she arrived home in a taxi, followed her up six flights of stairs, and stabbed her more than 40 times. The murder has devastated the Asian American community, many of whom were still reeling from the brutal murder of Militia, Michelle Alyssa Go, who was shoved into the path of an uncommon train at the Times Square station. She was killed. A year ago, six Asian women were killed in Metro Atlanta in a killing spree conducted by 22-year-old Robert Aaron Long. What's going on? Why is there so much hatred for Asian Americans? Today I have Leslie Liu, the founder of Reclaiming Your Courage, a self-defense and personal development program to help women of Asian American and Pacific Island heritage to stand up for themselves physically and mentally. Welcome to the Feisty. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me after such an emotionally disturbing weekend following the murder of Christina Yuna Lee. A 1900% increase in attacks against Asian America and Americans. What do you think is happening? I think what's happening is that um, this is not a new narrative. Like historically, Asians have been pit as a forever foreigner. And I think COVID uh, exasperated that and made us easy prey because there are no systematic systems in place to have any repercussions for anybody that is hunting us and murdering us. So I think it's a huge problem. Leslie, while I have you here, I wanna ask you a personal question. As an Asian American woman, do you feel seen in our society? What is your Asian American experience like in this America? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think that there is always an aspect of me feeling like I don't belong. And that even in America of not belonging, but even within the Asian community, like I don't feel Asian enough. I don't feel like a typical Asian. And what we're talking about here with crimes against Asian women specifically, um, we have to be better about having sharper tongues against the type of physical and non-physical attacks that are happening to us. And if you look at the statistics around what's happening to us, 68% of it is verbal harassment. So in the work that I do with Asian women specifically, it's much more than just physical. It's 
how do we use our words? How do we sharpen our tongues? So I think that a lot of Asian women can relate to the aspect of feeling minimized, of feeling gaslit, of dissolving. And right now we're terrified, we're angry, we're grieving because we're being murdered just by existing. Leslie, this is me and you. Let's take our gloves off and get real. What do you think is holding Asian American women back from standing up and saying, we ain't having it no more? It's, it's not because of us. It's, it's systematic racism that teaches us we have to be a model minority. We cannot show imperfection. That's why I'm trying to break that. I'm trying to say like, how are the comes out? I'm going to cuss. I'm going to yell. I'm going to be like, I'm not that, I'm not that type of Asian. Like, like it's cause we're terrified. We're scared and we're not taught. I think like, I'm really trying to advocate for black and Asian solidarity. Cause historically y'all have shown up for us, you know, like there is so much love there with like yellow peril and the black Panther party, you know, like I can't even like get to that with people because I'm like, we're, we're making this about like black on Asian crime or vice versa. I was like, no, this is like white supremacy. Like, let's be clear. And someone's got to be able to say that stuff. Like, you know, like I've been looking for like my black sisters, my, you know, like my other sisters, like I'm looking for my Asian sisters. Like I literally have to do a battle cry. And I'm like, where is everybody? Like, is everybody seeing this? Like, I don't want to die. I'm a mom. I got kids like girl, like I haven't been able to sleep for more than two hours, like every night, because like I'm holding my kids and I'm just like, I, I gotta, I gotta stay alive for my kids. I gotta like show my daughter and I gotta like show up, like even when it's painful and uh, I see my other sisters like suffering and they're quietly suffering because they don't want to make waves, but I'm like, I'm gonna go, like, uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm going, and um, that's why I'm so thankful that the universe brought me to you because I'm like I don't feel seen or heard, and I'm yelling and I'm screaming and like nobody holds space for that. Like other Asians, just to give you insight, like other Asians in other spaces, it's it's all like it's all proper. It's not like hey, what are you really feeling? Like, do you feel seen? Like, no, we feel like. We feel stuck and we feel like easy prey. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not easy prey. Like I will murder you or anyone that comes after my black sisters or my Asian sisters. So um, yeah, just thank you for um, holding space for me right now. Thank you, Leslie. I really appreciate you sharing your truth today. Let's stay connected and work together to fight this good fight. And for every Asian American watching this, I wanna, I have a few words I wanna say. As a black woman who is also an advocate to stop Asian hate, I have a suggestion to help reduce the stigma against Asian Americans, but you gotta want it. You can't just think about it. You have to do something about it. Are you ready to take action? There's a man by the name of Daryl Davis who convinced 200 people to lead the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. How did he do it? He took the time to spend time with them and allowed them to get to know him. After several conversations over beers and other activities, all of the racist stereotypes were busted and these white men who carried so much angst against all black people finally had a way of accepting the humanity in this one, which translated to accepting the humanity in all Blacks, leading them to walk away from white supremacy groups. Well, what does they have to do with Asian Americans? Let's be honest here. Asian Americans are self-aware enough to understand that most of you are smart, driven, and fiercely independent. So much so that you don't seek inclusion in our society. You form your own private social groups based on your cultures. You don't live outside of your neighborhoods. You don't walk into a place that you weren't invited into. You stay in line at all times, and that has worked for you so far. 
You've built businesses and created your dreams without too much hassle. But what has the self-imposed segregation caused you? It has caused you to become a mystery to almost everyone in our society. Everyone knows the new kid in school gets picked on and beat up so people can see what they're made of. That's why they do it. You're not the new kid, but you segregate yourself so much that everywhere you go, any abused person who needs to release the abuse he has received, he sees you as an easy target. My suggestion to help stop Asian hate is for you to include yourselves in our society more. I'm not talking about making a black friend or making a white friend. I'm talking about going into those spaces that you would never set foot into because it wasn't appropriate and becoming a part of it. If you're an Asian woman in college, join a black sorority. If you're a Christian, find a church with mostly white people or black people. Instead of sectioning off and having private Asian American focused activities, Find an organization that has a majority of people who do not look like you and join it. Show up one by one, infiltrate. Let them get to know you. Let them see the humanity in you. Cuss them out if they get on your nerves. Save the day if you have the skills to do so. I bet you if you do, and you happen to be a good person, you will gain a room full of allies who will not only, only learn to love you, but who will look at every other Asian person differently because of their relationship with you. I remember the first time I met a Mexican woman. Her name was Jules. She told me the most wild ass stories. I was like, whoa. <laughs> and now every time I see a Mexican person, I automatically laugh and I love them all because of the time I spent getting to know Jules. She allowed me to get to know her and love her. Break that barrier, step out of your bubble and go show our society that you're not the new kid on the block anymore. And what will I do? Me, Tierka, I will actively advocate for increasing Asian representation in media so that our society can see who you really are. Starting with the feisty news. I am a black woman, but this is not a black news show. All women are welcome to come, showcase your businesses, and share your life story so that we can get to know you. All women must be seen and heard, including Asian American women. Asian American sisters, you are cordially invited to bring your ass on over here to the feisty news and tell your stories. Bonus points if you're an organizer creating solutions to our society's problems. Then you're a feisty woman, and I would love to celebrate you. For anyone else who wants to stand in solidarity with all women, be sure to visit thefeistynews.com and subscribe to our newsletter so that we can let you know when we have our private women's life skills meetings. Let's get our minds right so that we can intentionally reshape the world. Do you want to be the woman who is a true definition of feisty? Who's laughing at Kanye's social media rants attacking his ex-wife? Find out the answer to these questions right after break. Don't miss out. Hi, Jazz here from JD Bath Co. My mission started with the creation of a vagina-friendly bath soak, Bomb AF, my love letter to women, but it didn't stop there. JD Bath Co. now has an entire line of clean beauty products made for sensitive skin from our handmade soaps to our skin conditioning and clearing oils to our best selling organic rose oil or one of our many organic vegan cruelty free body creams or the newly added line of body scrubs.
JD Beth Co. is located in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia, and we would love to have you shop with us. Come check us out at www.jdbathco.com. Look forward to seeing you. Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the Feisty News for Women. Girl, guess what? I promised that I would introduce you to a woman who is the true definition of feisty. I am so excited to introduce The Feisty Life, a new series that highlights the interesting choices and lifestyles of feisty women. These women will share their life stories openly so that every woman understands that being feisty means living life on your own terms. When average women go right, feisty women go left. And J. Kim Wright is no exception. Let's get to know our very first feisty woman in our new series, The Feisty Life. Kim, what choice did you make that goes against society's expectations for women? Hi, my name is Kim and I refuse to retire. Back when my son was born, when I was 19 years old, I realized that I was responsible for the world that he had to grow up in. And, uh, and I've arranged my life around that. Everything I've done since 1977 has been about making the world a better place. And so I've, I have designed my life to make the world a better place and not like from a sacrifice place, but from that place of, I am being taken care of and I love what I do. And why would I want to stop that when I'm making a difference and I'm having fun? So um, I had seven kids at home when I went to law school, <laughs> but I saw that being a lawyer was a way that I could actually change the system. And so I, I even now when I look back, I have no idea how I did it <laughs> or what I did, but I was working full time and raising kids and going to law school and I made it. And, um, and I got out and I started creating a law practice that was based on healing and peacemaking. And, um, and, and then I realized that I wanted to connect with other people around the world who were doing those same things. And I became a connector of um, this whole um, movement of integrative, holistic, compassionate healing lawyers. And in um, 2008, I quit um, my law practice. I uh, got rid of my house. And I became a digital nomad. Now this was before digital nomads were a thing. Now you actually know what a digital nomad was. Then they just said I was homeless. And uh, I went uh, went around the US at first. I had a car at that point. And um, I started interviewing people who were doing amazing things in the law. And I created a website called Cutting Edge Law. And uh, the American Bar Association, which is the largest organization of lawyers in the world, actually found my website which is kind of a miracle in and of itself. And they asked me to write a book about what I was doing. The editor came to me and said, you know, we think this is the way law is going and that you're onto something. And they, um, they actually recognized me as a visionary and they asked me to write this book. And then a couple of years later, I wrote another book. And so uh, that opened up the international movement for me. And so in, the, uh, uh, in about 2012, I started making international trips. I've gone around the world. Sometimes I circumnavigate. Um, sometimes I go and I stay for three months. Sometimes I uh, uh, make shorter trips. And uh, I just connect lawyers who are doing these amazing things into a community. And uh, of course, with COVID, I quit a lot of my travel, but then I started moving on to the internet and I started having Zoom gatherings and that's been even more rewarding. So I'm hoping again to travel this year. I um, have some plans in South Africa. Uh, I want to start a law school there actually. Um, they're already teaching my work in seven law schools in South Africa. And I've got another book coming out um, on trauma-informed law. It's really looking at the systemic problems with the old uh, legal system. And uh, I believe that what I'm doing is creating the new system. So why would I retire? I refuse to retire because I have such a fantastic life. And the reason I have this fantastic life is I've always put service and, um, and making a difference and being responsible for my children and now grandchildren and great grandchildren 
as I move forward into the world. And uh, and so I'm, I'm, I hope I never retire. I'm, I'm in good health and I'm energetic and I just love what I do. I love Kim's spicy life, making a difference and enjoying herself every step of the way. Thanks for being a feisty woman, Kim. In other news, once again, rapper Kanye West is trending because he has been causing a social media storm with his Instagram posts. As usual, he's being abrasive and super emotional and rowdy, but this time it isn't funny. I don't know about you, but as I watch him rant over his recent split from his ex-wife, Kim Kardashian, my heart breaks, not for him, but for her. If he weren't a big time celebrity and he was posting screenshots of private conversations publicly, threatening to beat up his ex's new boyfriend, telling people to hurt her boyfriend and sending a truckload of roses on Valentine's Day when he knows his ex is in a new relationship, we would call him a stalker and psycho. Besides the fact that his behavior is extremely embarrassing, it's also abusive. I bet Kim K is thinking, I can't believe I had four children from this <laughs> child. He's acting like a spoiled brat with no common sense, and he's showing that he has an extremely immature, abusive nature. No woman should have to shoulder the weight of filing for the divorce when you both know it's not working, taking care of the children primarily, and then have to deal with public attacks while she's just trying to move on with her life and be happy. That's all she wants is to be happy. To Kim K, I'm so sorry that this is happening to you. You would think that with all the fame and money you have, you would be able to overstep such F-boy behavior, but I guess it can happen to anyone. You believed in the best of him, even when everyone else was attacking him. You did your part. He wasn't emotionally mature enough to stand beside you. Yes, he was the one for you, the one to give you your children, but it doesn't mean he's the only one to bring you peace and happiness. And I figure you know that. Just keep going. To Kanye, I don't know who is in your circle misadvising you, or maybe you don't listen to anyone, but all the prayers to God won't help to get your family back together. Only changed behavior could do that. And even then, Kim K has free will and she can choose to move forward instead of looking back. But if you really want to have a chance at reuniting your family, you have to do one thing, give up. Give up abusing her and thinking that you're showing devoted love. Give up the entitlement to her time and her love. It doesn't belong to you. Give up the hope for her to love you again. Give up. Only then will you understand that the secret to love isn't force. Is kindness. If you want a chance for real, be the best friend she really needs by standing with her and not against her choices. She says she doesn't want you, accept it. Agree and support her decision. How would you treat a person you respect? Treat Kim that way. You can't force your way into her life. You can't use her name for likes and promotions for your album and concert. Maybe y'all have a secret deal that you can exploit your family to earn your next million, but for thousands of women watching, it's making us sick to our stomachs. The one benefit of watching you act like this is everybody already calls you crazy. And if this is crazy behavior, then any man who does the same will know for sure that it's crazy if he does it. Kanye, please stop abusing Kim in front of the whole world. She doesn't deserve it. And no one is calling you out because, oh, that's just crazy Kanye. It's not crazy Kanye anymore. It's abuse of Kanye now. I know your mama wouldn't be happy about that. Thank you for watching the Feisty News for Women. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the Feisty. Welcome to the Feisty. Welcome to the Feisty News for Women.